Hello everyone and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards and in this lesson number 133 we're going to continue our journey of software architecture anti-patterns and kind of finish up at least a segment of these uh, by looking at a related anti-pattern from the prior lesson, the stovepipe architecture anti-pattern. You can find a complete catalog of all of my lessons on Software Architecture Monday by going to my website, developer2architect.com slash lessons. As a matter of fact, most of the material in my lessons comes from these two books I recently wrote with my friend Neil Ford, The Fundamentals of Software Architecture and also Software Architecture, The Hard Parts. So let's talk about the stovepipe architecture anti-pattern. This anti-pattern is defined as an ad hoc collection of ill-related ideas, concepts, and components leading to a brittle architecture that's really hard to change. It gets its name, stovepipe architecture anti-pattern, uh, from the old-fashioned stoves, the wood stoves that they used to have in old-fashioned kitchens, and all of the heat and smoke needed to get out of the house. And so um, you can see here a collection of all the basic stovepipe things that route the smoke and the heat away from the house. And that's kind of how it gets its name because everything is really just simply bolted on without much planning in the stovepipe architecture anti-pattern. So the first question I want to address is where does this come from? I want to talk about the reasons and kind of the drivers of how you arrive at a stovepipe architecture anti-pattern. I want to show you a couple of examples of the stovepipe architecture, uh, both from a monolith and also using microservices. And then finally, I want to show you a few avoidance techniques of how to avoid this common anti-pattern. Well, it's interesting. The first driver is actually related to the prior lesson, number 132, the architecture by implication anti-pattern. So if you haven't seen that lesson, I would encourage you to kind of stop the video or maybe just watch it after this one. Um, but the architecture by implication really is describing just getting started on a particular system or project without thinking about the architecture. That does, in fact, lead to a stovepipe architecture anti-pattern, that kind of bolting on of ill-related ideas, concepts, and components. As a matter of fact, in Lesson 16, I talked about architecture teams and how difficult they can be sometimes. In that Lesson number 16, I introduced another anti-pattern called the Witch's Brew anti-pattern, which is also related and drives towards the stovepipe architecture anti-pattern, where a collection of architects really don't agree on a common vision and direction. And if you haven't seen Lesson 16, I would really encourage you to at least watch the video to see that anti-pattern in action. Well, there are other factors, by the way, including another anti-pattern that does lead to stovepipes. One of those is simply not having an architect or the role of an architect on a project. This is closely related to architecture by implication, uh, but also it might be related simply to the lack of collaboration. You may, in fact, have an architect on your project. And this leads to that ivory tower architect anti-pattern, where the architect sits on top of their ivory tower, uh, dictating commands to all the development teams down below, and there's no collaboration. This also can contribute to the stovepipe architecture anti-pattern. And there is one other contributing factor, and that really is a lack of an integration plan or an integration architecture. You see, the stovepipe architecture can be related to an application architecture, but it can also be related to an entire ecosystem of all the systems and applications within a department that all need to talk to one another. And every time we have additional functionality, we simply just bolt on another application and it looks like an ugly mess. So these are some of the factors that contribute to the stovepipe. Let's see a couple of examples and then let's see some avoidance techniques on how to, how to, how to avoid the stovepipe architecture anti-pattern. 
Well, let's take a look at a very common one with monolithic applications. And so this is a well-formed, uh, great intentions, and it works fine, this architecture. As a matter of fact, it's pretty solid until changes start to occur. When we want to start managing and processing purchase orders, we simply bolt it on to this monolithic application. As a matter of fact, maybe we want to start doing more sophisticated inventory reporting. We bolt this on with another stovepipe fitting, and from there we say, but you know, there's this MLAI thing. You know, we might take all that reporting feeds and we might do some order analytics to better determine our demographics. Hence another stovepipe fitting. We bolt these factors on. As a matter of fact, in this monolithic application, maybe as you place an order, you can immediately start streaming your video. Well, we can do that in this application. And without an architecture, this is just bolted in place. As a matter of fact, well, wait a minute, let's put another fitting here because we also have some new features we're going to want to do to download your ebook right away from the order entry system and maybe stream that audio book that you got or that uh, maybe music or something. And you can see this is a great example of the stovepipe architecture anti-pattern where kind of lacking an architecture, this is a collection of ill-defined ideas, concepts, and components that have no cohesion between them. This results in either an extremely large monolith that doesn't work <laughs> or separate systems that are all tied and dependent to this one monolithic application. Well, let's look at an example in microservices. So if we're going to take microservices here, let's say we have these, these six services A through F, and we do all the due diligence to create a really solid microservices architecture, where each request goes to a specific single purpose service, owning its own data. This, folks, is exactly how to do microservices. This, this was well formed. But what, folks, happens? Well, let's say we make a change to that first request that goes to service A. Based on that new functionality, suddenly now, and we didn't have to do this before, we have to now go to service D and E, and E now needs additional data from service D. But then we make a change to the requests made to service F. And all of a sudden now, where it didn't have to do it before, service F now also all of a sudden has to reach out to service A, B, and C from workflow or a data perspective. We may even change service B's functionality to enhance it or to add a few new features to that particular area of functionality, which now requires all sorts of other intercommunication to services it didn't need before. Those three changes in an architecture that was super sound, very sound, now becomes, you guessed it, a big ball of distributed mud. Another great example of stovepipe architecture anti-pattern, where the lack of thinking about the structure of that system suddenly turns it in to all this mud. So let's conclude this lesson by actually taking a quick view at some avoidance patterns. And a matter of fact, this is actually related to lesson 38 when I talked about identifying microservices, but we can use that same pattern here to avoid the stovepipe. And here's the process. When a change occurs, and I'm going to use the example of a microservices or a highly distributed architecture, identify where to apply those changes. Maybe it's a single service, maybe it's one or two services. And then we apply those changes to those particular services. Now, at this point, unfortunately, this is where the process stops. And this, folks, is how the big ball of distributed mud happens. And we start to create a stovepipe architecture where we're just bolting on different pieces, not thinking about the structural aspect. So the first thing we do after we apply a change is to say, well, but wait a minute. Do I need additional data that I didn't need before? Because before, when we identified our services and its corresponding data in a well-formed bounded context, 
we didn't need additional data, but based on these new changes, now all of a sudden I do. And as a matter of fact, that service on the left-hand side becomes so big that we end up now refining the granularity based on new functionality. Again, single purpose, separately deployed services that do one thing really well. But then we don't stop there because now that I need other people's data, I may have dependencies based on needing to access that data or even workflow. And in that case, when I start to analyze what new dependencies exist based on applying those new changes, I retrograde here all the way back to now adjusting the service granularity. And then I take a look and see the last part of the change, which is, am I now having to do additional orchestration or choreography between services? Am I having to connect more services than is probably necessary? At that point, we go back to refine that service granularity, possibly making larger services or smaller ones, and then continue to repeat this process. The way to avoid the stovepipe architecture anti-pattern and correspondingly, the big ball of distributed mud. Hey, so we actually talked about two anti-patterns here, <laughs> is to follow this process for every change that you make. All right, so this has been Lesson 133, yet more fun with architecture anti-patterns. Um, but we've seen two or three of these already in a row, so I'm gonna take a break from these in the next lesson, which will be in two more weeks, where we'll talk about another topic in software architecture that I think you might find very interesting. So until then, uh, stay tuned every other Monday for another lesson in software architecture. Thank you so much for listening.